focus on that. So thank you for that as well. Um, so here I am. Let me get myself settled here. The new AJCC staging is about to begin. Actually, the AJCC staging, um, the AJCC staging uh, was done in conjunction with the UICC. Um, many expert panels, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, about exactly um, what that's all about. And let me tell you up front, I've been fighting a little cold, so I hope that doesn't get in the way of this talk. And secondly, this is dry information. I'd like to make it a little interactive. If anyone has any questions as we move through this, please stop me and we can chat about it very briefly. Um, and then again, at the end, we'll save a little bit of time for, for questions. So some of this I'm going to go relatively quickly, but um, I think many of you know um, and have highlighted why revise the TNM staging system. Um, in, in essence, the um, uh, molecular data has an impact on treatment of cancer, of cancer, and so one must incorporate that into the staging schemes. About every five to seven years, uh, the new manuals come up. This particular eighth edition has gone through um, many, many um, experts. Um, and as you will note towards the end, and I'll share with you some of the errata information, there continues to be revisions of this manual. So this is truly uh, a work in progress. So new in the AJCC um, edition, I'm going to point out a couple of areas. It's impossible for me to get through all the details. I'm told that this is being um, this is being um, uh, filmed and it'll also being recorded and it'll be available so you can actually take a look at some of the slides if you would like to. Um, the big updates um, in the eighth edition is chapter one, which is something that we'll be talking about. For physicians, this is actually an area of instruction and so I'm going to beg and plead with the clinicians in this room to actually and you don't have to read the entire chapter but please please go back and take a look because these are our guidelines so please look at chapter one um, some of the biggest features that have been talked about over and over again is of course the prognostic factors that are now going to be a part of staging the new chapters, you could see it's a, it's a multitude of chapters and sub-chapters. Um, they've split chapters, they've merged chapters, they've deleted chapters. You name it, it has all occurred and a continued work in progress, even to date. So the eighth edition approach this time was simply to not only look at the anatomic extent of disease, which is something that we always do in particular in the cancer registry and time of diagnosis, but now rather to include those prognostic factors with some examples that you're all very familiar with. Um, this, these non-anatomic cancer factors um, are what's supplementing the TNM. That's your biggest and major impact in uh, cancer today. So we can't forget about what we talk about as extent of the disease, the T, the N, and the M. By the way, worldwide, this uh, eighth edition has already, already been rolled out with the exception of the United States. The United States opted to keep it back um, because it needed additional training for cancer registrars and physicians. So worldwide, when prognostic factors are not available, this is still going to be the core staging that will be compared to. Um, so these are the elements in, in, in uh, the TNM. Um, really not new, but areas in which I think we tend to forget. The clinical and pathologic, everybody talks about, right? We're always struggling to get physicians to stage clinically. Pathologically, I think we're doing a much better, um, what much better in pathologic staging, in particular with the CAP protocols from pathology that helps the clinicians to do this. Let's not forget the TNM and then, of course, subcategories. And the big feature, of course, is the uh, prognostic stage groups. So another area that becomes very interesting that I don't think many physicians think about is really the time frame and the need to clinically stage um, for comparisons across 
uh, patient cohorts. It's really important to clinically stage the cases. And in uh, looking at that, we have a four-month period after diagnosis or at time progression. That's when clinical staging actually ends. Pathologic, you know you use all the information, including the surgery. Um, Post-therapy and recurrence information is an area that is often sort of forgotten by physicians, and yet in today's world, we're actually looking at determining um, um, time points, and we're looking at post-therapy, um, and so you have the YC uh, TNM, which is uh, used with neoadjuvant um, treatment. Um, also, the YPTNM. Now, interesting in the tumor registry, we have no placeholders for these recurrent, these post therapy information. Very limited, very brief, and most places, including Epic, don't even take this into account. So, I don't know how the eighth edition is going to roll everything out, but these are valid stages that clinicians are now asking to document because of what's going on today. Recurrence and treat, retreatment. We've had much work on that here at Smilo in particular. This is a stage of interest, and I'm not sure how that's going to be handled in future. Autopsy, I think we all know how that goes. The X designation is something that, in general, has been taken away um, from the sixth uh, from. Uh, the sixth edition uh, staging manual, and yet people continue to use the stage X pretty regularly. There are some exceptions, but overall, there is no longer any MX category. So that really has been eliminated ever since the sixth edition, and yet clinicians uh, uh, continue to use that over and over again. Um, the, the abuse of the X designation is standing out because across the system, when you put in an X, you cannot group stage a case. So many times when researchers come and say, you know, I need all stage one cases or all stage two, and I say to them, you need to make sure that you're putting this completely. And this is what is now being asked. Um, we, cancer registrars, um, are also going to avoid um, recording the X, but there are exceptions um, when prognostic factors are not available to us. So what's the role for the Commission on Cancer? The Commission on Cancer in two areas tell us that we must document clinical staging, and it's part of the eligibility requirements in the Commission on Cancer. The second area that we must document is a discussion in tumor boards. Um, I attended a head and neck tumor board um, y uh, yesterday, and they had a wonderful discussion on, t on the new 8th edition, one of the chapters there, and I thought that would be probably one of the best places in which we can have actual discussions of each disease chapter um, because it's important that you do it with the interested parties in that group. Um, from the Commission on Cancer perspective, we have to make sure that all of our cases are being clinically staged in tumor boards. And that's why we constantly bother you and ask you to continue to stage clinically uh, when, when applicable. So in that uh, vein, um, we all know that pathologists um, do staging, complete their staging under CAP protocols, and that has been an incredible um, help, I think, because our overall path staging here is actually increased pretty, pretty significantly. We know that the radiologist plays a very important role, and by the way, the rumor is that a similar to the CAP protocols is actually going to be into, uh, take into effect the radiology report is going to have some kind of format uh, similar to that CAP protocol. And we know how important um, their feedback is. But at the end of the day, it is truly the managing physician that continues to have the responsibility because they know the entire picture of that patient. And so it's important to note that it is still the managing physician not cancer registrars, not pathology because they have part of the story, but rather those treating physicians. They, they are the ones that really need to continue to stage. You should also know that in the cancer registry, 
we are required now to stage clinically and pathologically in the absence of physician staging. And that is because physicians really have not done com complete staging throughout time. And so because of that, it becomes a problem um, for researchers. And so cancer registrars in the cancer registry have complete staging. Um, the, there's 14 general rules, and this chapter is very boring. It took me several weeks to get through the actual complete chapter. So I apologize for this dry material, but yet this is the template for how we must stage. So I'm going to only highlight a couple of area, areas. Um, in order to AJCC, there must be a microscopic confirmation. When information is unavailable, for prognostic factor categories, then you can use the X. It's okay. And again, keep in mind, worldwide there are many countries, um, many registries that will not have that prognostic factor information, and so we're going to continue to use the TNM as our baseline. Um, but here in the U.S. and here at SMILO, we should make sure that we include all the prognostic factors that are required within the staging system. And finally, an area that I think many physicians don't realize because they always think that the diagnosis occurs with the pathologic stage, and it actually doesn't. For the four cancer registry and the beginning of this implementation of the eighth edition, the diagnosis date is when a physician says there is, um, there is a cancer or a likely cancer. That is the date of diagnosis. So there's a lot of talk about when does this begin? Is it specimen driven? Is it this? Is it that? When a physician, and it could be a, a non pathologist, says that there is cancer, that is the date of diagnosis. So the date of the beginning of the AJCC 8th edition is actually date of diagnosis, January 1st, 2018. So there's been so much change that as recent as November 14th, I, I can't make this stuff up. The entire breast chapter in our manual um, was actually changed. And so the entire breast chapter has actually been updated. That is just an indication of how much change has taken place and very challenging for all of us to keep informed because of so many changes at so many time points here. Um, I'm not going to go through much of the chapters. I, I offered some examples of areas of changing. For example, the breast, LCIS, you know, is now no longer TNM stageable. But guess what? The cancer registry continues to report those cases. So many people ask me about that. I don't know why it might be a situation like the squamous and the basal where we ultimately do not um, capture that information, but as it stands today, they're not stageable, but we continue to, um, to code that information into the cancer registry. Um, there's some clarifications in particular on synchronous tumors that become so complicated and a lot of information there in the breast chapter in particular. One of the most um, in-depth chapters. Uh, the lung chapter has the T category changes and the M category has been subcategorized. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually from Dr. Detterbeck who shared with us the new uh, uh, TNM classifications. I actually have cards. I will begin to um, provide any or some of the information in tumor boards um, as time progresses. Uh, these are the thyroid changes. I'm not going to read them all because we really don't have a lot of time to talk about each change. I do want to share with you, you know, about the 8th edition implementation at SMILO. So what's EPIC doing? EPIC will, and I had a conversation with Brett Morrow this morning just before I came to this meeting, is I am told that EPIC will be up and running with the 8th edition January 1st, 2018. So the, they will actually switch to the eighth edition. Now, I don't think they have the ability to switch back because that's sort of that borderline where many cancers may be diagnosed in December, which means they actually still fall in the seventh edition. So that transition becomes a little bit confusing, but EPIC will turn on the eighth edition January 1st. That's what the targeted time period. They've already vetted the uh, manuals and the forms. Um, it appears that the AJCC has um, provided 
um, information so that the vendors will have this available beginning of the year. So today, in the uh, under Yale New Haven Hospital, so for many, many residents, I realize many um, physicians are on the Yale University intranet, but maybe we'll be able to do something when it becomes available. We actually had the cancer staging manual forms on the internet for YNHH. We've had it there for years of the seventh edition. And so with a little luck when it becomes available, it's not available yet, with a little luck when it becomes available, we will also do the same for the eighth edition manual. And it's really very easy, very user friendly. You simply go on to the Yale New Haven site, go on to the document section, there's the staging and you just click whatever chapter you need and your staging form pops up and it's just an information or you can print out those staging forms as well. So it's just helpful. Via oncology, I'm told there will be likely a delay on the eighth edition staging. So I. I'm told there was a meeting to follow later today, so I don't know how that's going to um, correlate with the, um, with the EPIC staging or any of that information. But that's the information that I have as of just before walking in here to find out about staging. I think the, the, the main point here is that this eighth edition is certainly evolving um, cancer care because of the changes and the information available, there are an incredible amount of er erratas that go along with this. Um, and so, you know, yes, we're in the era of precision and personalized patient care. This is a, a new era in, in technology that, that is just moving at such a fast pace. I'm told this might be um, one of the last times that they actually put a book out um, instead of having this all available electronically um, up front. Um, but again, today we have to deal with what we have. So we have about a thousand page book, if anybody has the book, I actually have it in the front and I put it on the floor because it's even too heavy, I thought it might break the table. Um, it's a huge, huge uh, manual, um, but an incredible amount of information. I think they tried to make it as granular as possible, which makes it complex, it makes it site specific, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the physicians here will continue the practice at tumor boards to spend maybe 10, 15 minutes, something like that, to go over some of the new chapters that are relevant to their particular specialties. Um, so this is just a, a quick um, overview, um, again, dry material. I apologize for that, um, but it is what it is. The registry will promise, and I don't know exactly how, maybe Dr. Fuchs, maybe Dr. Lillenbaum will, will come up with some really good solid ideas of how we can continue to share all of the erratas and the revisions because I think it's impossible for a physician, there's about 400 pages of the errata alone. I think it's almost impossible for each physician or group to know that they need to make these uh, very important changes. And some of them are, are you know, just, just grammar uh, type changes and many of them are, but some of them are very important things such as the new breast chapter completely in its entirety needs to be downloaded because the one in the book is obsolete today. So that's what I have for today. Any questions? <laughs>